Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes. Who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost. And... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute. Let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's、mm, Head. Ah,、oh, the Lion's Head. Okay. Well, then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said just go through to the next T junction. Okay. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you, and a large two-story building on the corner. Ah,、uh, yes, I can see them. Okay. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. Okay, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street, W E S L E Y, number seventy, where the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letter box and some bushes in front of the house. Okay, fifth house, number seventy. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions six to ten. As you listen, answer questions six to ten. Who's speaking? Hi, Margaret. It's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course. What? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message, but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh dear. He said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. Okay, I'll call him. What's his number? O four eight two, five six three three seven nine. Ah, so that's O four eight five. No, no, O four eight two, five six three three seven nine. Okay, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letter box. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, okay. Wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right then, and don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a talk about the food we eat. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the food we eat, sponsored by Safeway. Increasingly, we know more about the effects of our eating habits and lifestyles on our health. While new information can change old ideas, the new stories can often be confusing. At Safeway, we try to help customers not only in the range and types of food offered, but also by providing up-to-date, reliable information in areas we know are of interest and which relate to the diet we eat. Today, we are going to talk about sugar. Recently, doctors have been advising us to eat less sugar. The health recommendation to use less sugar is for two reasons. Firstly, for the sake of our teeth since the amount and frequency of sugar consumption links to decay. Secondly, as sugar is a good source of calories, it can easily be a problem if we tend to be overweight. The dental risk is because bacteria which occur naturally in our mouth feed on carbohydrates, sugar and starch, to form plaque and acid. Plaque is a sticky coating that prevents the bacteria being removed by saliva. The acid attacks the tooth itself. This takes time, however, so the trick is to avoid sticky foods like sweets, which stay around in crevices feeding the bacteria. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Regular brushing, preferably with a fluoride toothpaste, helps remove particles and resist acid. The worst thing you can do is nibble sweet things between meals. It puts your teeth under constant attack. A sweet tooth develops gradually and you might be surprised at how you can steadily unlearn the taste, taking in fewer calories and saving your teeth. Here are some ways. A. Gradually cut down the sugar in tea and coffee till you can stop altogether or switch to sweetness. B. Choose snacks with a lower sugar content. Fresh fruit, raw vegetables, crackers, Milk or low-flat natural yogurt. Remember, some fruits like raisins have lots of sugar. C. Look for reduced sugar alternatives. There are more and more around, from diet drinks to yogurts, even jams and sauces. D. Try gradually to cut back on the sugar you use in cooking, especially in baking. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. hear a conversation between a research student, Jeremy, and his supervisor. They are talking about the process of having a research project published in a journal. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25.
So, you're nearly ready to submit your article to an academic journal, are you? Yes, I think so. I just wanted to go over all the things I need to do before I submit it. And then, I wanted to go over the submission process with you. Great. So, firstly, you need to write an abstract. Make sure it's short and concise. Of course. I forgot all about that. And what about key words? Huh, yes, a lot of students overlook this part and just jot down whatever comes to mind. But take some time to make a list of key words that are accurate and relevant. Okay, another thing. Could you have a look at my article before I submit it? Absolutely. Actually, at least two senior staff members should always read through a final draft before submission. Do you mind if I give it to Professor Johnson to have a look at as well? Not at all. I'd be glad to have the feedback. Do you know which journal you want to submit to yet? Not yet. I have a short list of about three that I'm interested in. Make that decision soon, because you'll need to adjust your article so that it matches the style guide of the journal you are submitting to. I bet that can take a while. Yes, but after that you are just about ready to submit. One more thing, you'll have to sign the copyright form, just confirming that it's your own work, and then you're good to go. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, the submission process. How does it work exactly? Well, the first thing is to just send it off. You've got to send in the manuscript before anything else can happen. Sure. And then should I call to check if they have received it? No need for that, no. All you have to do is just log on to your email regularly because you will get a submission confirmation once they have processed the manuscript. And that will have comments on what they thought of it? No, no comments yet. That email is just to let you know they have received it. The next stage is what is known as peer review. This is when experts in the field review your manuscript and decide whether to accept it. Ah, they'll never accept me. I'm only a master's student. Don't worry about that, Jeremy. It's all done through a double-blind method. That means that whoever reads your manuscript has no idea whether you are a grad student or a Nobel Prize laureate. They'll only be judging your work, not you. Well, that's good to hear. And then what, once they've made their decision? Well, there are four possible outcomes. You might get an acceptance. But a first-off acceptance is very, very rare. Don't pin your hopes on it. You could also get a rejection, but these don't happen very often either. I don't think this will be a problem. What do you think I'll get? <laughs> if you're very lucky, you'll get a conditional acceptance. This means that they've accepted the article and it will be published, but you need to tweak a few things first. A sentence here, a heading there, nothing major. That sounds good. But to be honest, you will probably end up with a revise and resubmit. This means they are definitely interested, but you will need to rework the paper before it's accepted. The necessary changes will be outlined by the reviewers. Okay. So I just fix the things that need changing and present it again? Yes, but include a cover letter that discusses the changes you have made. The same goes for a conditional acceptance, actually. It helps the reviewers see that you've taken their criticism seriously. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear an introduction about the tutorial courses of the physics school. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to orientation week. This is the physics school session, and we'll welcome Professor Smith, the head of the school, to introduce you to the tutorial system. Welcome, Professor Smith. <laughs> Thank you. You may have noticed life at university is totally different from that of school. For you, tutorials are an important part of the teaching program. Tutors are the primary contact between undergraduate students and the school. A tutor is the student's personal tutor as well as their academic tutor. Tutorials for physics undergraduates consist of six students who meet each week with their tutor for at least fifty minutes. For radiographer students. Tutorials will normally consist of a group of about ten students who will meet fortnightly with their tutor for a period of at least fifty minutes. In the first semester, the tutorials are during weeks one to eleven. For semester two, they are during weeks fourteen to twenty-four. Everybody involved is expected to be present and on time. And the tutor will also be available in week twelve and twenty-five to discuss problems that arise during revision. But attendance by students is optional. Now I'm going to introduce to you the stages and activities of the tutorials. The induction period is from week one to three. I know that a significant minority of you experience culture shock during your first few months at university, and the important function of this stage is to identify students who are having difficulty integrating into the academic program. In particular, tutors should check your attendance of lectures, tutorials, laboratory sessions, and this sort of things. Tutors also help you tackle work in a systematic and effective manner. Stage two begins from the fourth week. Some tutorials of this period are to be devoted to discussion or going over the students' lecture notes, but approximately fifty percent of tutorial time is to be devoted to coursework. You should finish the weekly homework assignments of two hours duration with at least fifty percent involving written work. At least eight homework assignments during the year should involve answering problems set on coursework. The written work collected by the tutor should be marked within a week of handing in, and generally the assignments should be graded. The third stage starts from week eight till the tenth. During this period, math and four core physics programs are included. The majority of tutorial time should be devoted to work which supports the lecture programs and laboratory work. At least sixty percent of homework assignments should involve written work. The assignment may involve writing an account of or notes on a specified range of topics. The written work should also be marked and graded. Short oral presentations by students should be included. They are possibly on general physics topics or essays. The last week's personal development planning is a structured and supported process. The primary objective for PDP is to help you to become more independent and confident, self-directed learners, and encourage a positive attitude to learning throughout life. It is undertaken by yourselves to reflect upon their own learning, performance, and achievement, and to plan for their personal, educational, and career development. Finally. If, without evidence of good reason, you miss more than two sessions during a semester, or if the tutor is not satisfied with your progress, 
The matter must be immediately referred to the program director, who will normally issue formal warning, verbal and written. This will inform you that your place at university is under threat of withdrawal if no improvement is made. That is the end of part four. You now have.